Hello, and welcome to Revolutions. Episode 9.26, The Last Caudillo. Welcome to the penultimate episode of Series 9, the episode that will take us to the quote-unquote end of the Mexican Revolution. And the man who will take us to that final endpoint is Alvaro Obregón, who serves as the living bridge between the revolution and the post-revolution. He was the last revolutionary caudillo who led the last successful revolt and used that victory to secure and entrench a stable civilian government that institutionalized a confusing and oftentimes contradictory memory of the revolution, rooted in equal parts fact and fiction, reality and propaganda. In the spring of 1919, Obregón had been in retirement for close to two years, peacefully biding his time. The principle of no re-election had been embedded into the Constitution of 1917, and so President Carranza would have no choice but to finally retire himself in 1920. So should Obregón choose to run for president, his victory was practically a foregone conclusion. And he very much planned to run. And so though he was in retirement, Obregón kept touch with groups who might support him. Land reformers who couldn't believe Carranza was letting the Asandados retrench themselves, middle-class liberal constitutionalists who chafed at Carranza's high-handed authoritarian streak, labor leaders who were still furious at Carranza's betrayal in 1916 after they had supplied him with the Red Battalions. In 1919, these groups were in just sort of a holding pattern, waiting for Carranza to leave the stage. Though he had been the premier jefe, the first chief of the revolution, Carranza had never really embodied the revolution, and so everyone turned to Obregón to finish what the revolution had started. But there was a bit of a hitch to this natural and seemingly inevitable transfer of power from Carranza to Obregón. Carranza decided he didn't want to transfer power to Obregón. Sure, he publicly supported the constitutionalist principle of no re-election, but that didn't mean Carranza wanted to give up power. His plan was to find some puppet and get him elected president so that Carranza could continue to rule from behind the scenes. And Obregón was a lot of things, but he was no man's puppet. So even before the 1920 elections were scheduled, Carranza started taking shots at Obregón publicly and privately, trying to undermine his former general's reputation. Carranza implied Obregón wasn't up for the job, that he didn't understand national issues or responsibilities, that he was merely a corrupt influence peddler. And one wonders if Carranza's not doing a bit of projection here. With this whisper campaign underway, Obregón concluded he wouldn't play the part of gentleman farmer any longer. Though he would always lean hard on the Washington-esque, oh, I'm being reluctantly called to my duty, he also needed to state forthrightly that he was the man for the job, and if Mexico would have him as their president, that he would serve. On June the 1st, 1919, Obregón formally announced his candidacy. The theme of his campaign would be peace, reunification, and reconciliation. He said that those who had supported the revolution had been abused and alienated by men whose only ideology was personal power. This is a barely disguised shot at Carranza. And that, in contrast, Obregón would bring everyone together. He would end all the rebellions. He would fulfill the yet unfulfilled promise of the revolution. Obregón presented himself as a man of no faction and with no ambition but the glorious revival of Mexico. And as a part of this project of peace and reconciliation, Obregón actually played down his military career. He made it plain that he had retired from the army. The new Mexico should be a civilian Mexico. It was right and proper. And so he presented himself to the voters as a civilian in a suit, not a general in a uniform, and he promised to win this campaign at the ballot box, not on the battlefield. And I think that here in June of 1919, this was utterly sincere, especially because given the coalition he was going to be able to muster and the national fame he enjoyed, there was no reason to think that Obregón would lose the 1920 election. There was, however, in June of 1919, another man in Mexico who had similar fame and name recognition and who believed that he could be the one to unify the country in a post-revolutionary period of reconciliation and reconstruction, Felipe Angeles. But rather than embracing a civilian posture, when Angeles rejoined Pancho Villa in northern Mexico, he redonned his uniform. Villa and Angeles hoped that 1919 would be like 1913 and 1914 all over again, 
and in many ways the political landscape, at least in Chihuahua, looked the same. There was an unpopular authoritarian in Mexico City whose corrupt lackeys and brutal thugs were garrisoning the state. The federal army was now lazy, despised by the inhabitants, the men were demoralized and drunk, the officers were at cross-purposes and engaged in their own bitter personal rivalries. Meanwhile, Pancho Villa and Felipe Angeles were leading a sturdy band of a few thousand dedicated rebels. And as the spring of 1919 dawned, one had to wonder if what had happened before would happen again. But it does not. Because though there were similarities, there were also critical differences. For one, the economy of Chihuahua was wrecked. They simply could not arm, supply, feed, or provide horses for a new Division del Norte. And more importantly, despite some early recruiting successes, the state was not exactly rallying to their banner. People were tired of fighting. When Villa's little army came through, the young men of a village would go off and hide in the hills. So Angelis would give his political speeches to women and children and old folks, but those who might fight stayed out of sight. But even still, Villa and Angelis launched their first strike on April the 12th, targeting the relatively lightly garrisoned city of Parral. The fight there was intense and bloody, but eventually the Federal Army unit garrisoning the city broke and fled. Villa's men then raided the city for supplies and departed. Over the next two months, they would continue to march around, Angelis giving speeches, officers trying to get more volunteers, but they found very little enthusiasm. At best, they invoked a sort of sullen neutrality. This one last great campaign sputtered quickly and came to an ignoble end. About two weeks after Obregón announced his candidacy for president, Villa, Angelis, and their little army of a few thousand rode for Juarez. Angelis did not want to attack Juarez. Remember, his whole plan was to get back in good with the Americans, to forestall an American invasion of Mexico, and riding right up to the border and then firing guns into the air seemed like a really good way to trigger the very invasion Angelis wanted to avoid. But Villa was determined. Partly it was because they needed supplies, partly it was because the Juarez garrison was pretty small and they might actually defeat them, but one also starts to get the feeling like Villa is maybe just asking for trouble. On June the 15th, 1919, Villa ordered his men to go take Juarez. After a short and confusing battle, Villa's men took the city and forced the Federal Army units into a nearby army fort. On June the 16th, Villa planned to storm the fort, but the bullets flying into El Paso had brought down the worst-case scenario on his head. The U.S. Army received permission to cross the border and drive Villa off. Facing the full force of the U.S. Army, Villa ordered a retreat. He couldn't beat them and he would never again threaten a major city. This did not, however, turn out to be the American invasion Angeles and so many other Mexicans dreaded, and once their mission was complete, the U.S. Army went home. But the fact that they had even joined in the hostilities was the death of Angeles's dreams. There could be no reconciliation between Villa and the Americans. Villa hated the gringos as much as ever. The Americans thought Villa a bandit and a criminal, not a potential ally. In the aftermath of the debacle at Juarez, Villa and Angeles did not even have the food or supplies necessary to all stay together, so Villa once again scattered his forces into small bands. Angeles, despondent, told Villa, I am going to leave, and Villa said okay. They departed as friends and comrades with no hard feelings. Villa gave Angeles a small bodyguard to escort him around. Both men could not have known that this would be the last time that they would see each other, but they likely suspected as much. And it was. The partnership of Villa and Angeles was one of the most successful partnerships of the whole Mexican Revolution. But that was a lifetime ago. It was all over now. Meanwhile, the real, actual movement towards unified post-revolutionary peace was getting going just next door in Sonora, with Obregón's campaign for president. And he was building up a base of support out there. Though he took his oblique shots at Carranza, Obergon didn't want to be too provocative. Unlike Angelis, for example, who kept pitching the abandonment of the Constitution of 1917, Obergon believed it legitimate and believed that it should be kept. And being a pretty skilled politician, Obergon said that he was happy to implement Article 27 as much as possible and that some land redistribution was necessary, but he also let it be known through private back channels that he wasn't going to upend the world here. There would be no more confiscation of property. And to the Americans, he said, look, I'm not going to go crazy nationalizing everything. 
As for the labor rights that would be guaranteed by Article 123, Obregón was a free market capitalist, but he believed that there could be no peace unless some labor demands were recognized. This can't be owners and bosses exploiting poor workers. I mean, that's how we got into this mess. So in April of 1919, Obregón signed a secret pact of mutual support with the leaders of the union that had succeeded the CASA. Obregón said that he would implement laws that would make the promise of Article 123 a reality, and in exchange, they would support his candidacy for president with organization, money, and votes. Obregón could also, of course, count on support from the middle-class liberal constitutionalists who were aiming at something more like a parliamentary democracy for Mexico and certainly wanted more radical social reforms. Carranza had left them frustrated and dissatisfied. But Carranza's strongest support came from the clique of Sonoran leaders who had been together since the first shots of the revolution. I've only mentioned them in passing and haven't gone into detail on them, but this is Benjamin Hill, a guy named Adolfo de la Huerta, and most especially... Plutarco Elias Callas. These were the men who had organized and led the revolution that put Carranza in power in the first place, and they were now almost to a man ready to pitch him overboard. Obregón was also going to get critical support from one group that had battled him in the original conflict between the constitutionalists and the conventionists, and that is the Zapatistas. It is remarkable that the Zapatista movement held together after the death of the man who had given them their name. But hold together they did. Because though there was always rivalries and infighting, jealousy and bickering, it turns out that there was a lot more holding the leaders of Morelos together than just mutual loyalty and respect for the man, Zapata. So the death of Zapata was shocking, but it was not the end of the line for the movement he had started. In fact, even as General Pablo Gonzalez once again believed that he could declare victory, the assassination of Zapata, such an act of dishonest treachery, hardened public opinion against Carranza and General Gonzalez and softened it towards the guerrillas who were still out there fighting. In the weeks and then months that followed Zapata's assassination, the fighters retreated into the hills and now numbered no more than 2,500 active soldiers. But those small, out of power and with only limited military capacity, the Zapatistas fought on. Much of the credit for this goes to Ildardo Magana, whose own skill as a political leader now fully revealed itself. Magana spent those weeks and months after Zapata's death continuing his unceasing efforts to link the Zapatistas to a wider national cause, but also to solidify his own leadership in Morelos. If the various Zapatista chiefs splintered, that really would be the end of them, and the fact that Magana managed to talk them all into letting him be their leader was pretty remarkable, especially because Magana wasn't even a fighting man. He was on the intellectual side, the political and diplomatic side. But Magana wrote and met with and talked to various Zapatista generals, and in early September, he called a junta of all the recognized chiefs, many of whom, like De La O, had been fighting from the very beginning, and they had been there when they all got together for the first time and elected Zapata to be their leader. In another small vote of 32 assembled leaders or their surrogates, Magana secured votes from 18 of them. His next closest rival got just 11. So with Magana now officially head of the Liberating Army of the South, he proceeded to republish manifestos, reiterate their commitment to land and justice and the plan of Ayala. And six months after Zapata's death, the Zapatistas were all mostly working together towards the same goal under a single leader— it's amazing how much they held together. But like I said, they believed in the movement enough to subordinate their own individual egos. With his new mandate for command, Magana continued his courtship of other potential national leaders and rebels. He talked to Felix Diaz, Pancho Villa, a guy named Peleus who had opened up his own little rebellion around Tampico. And then, of course, when Obregón announced his candidacy for president in June of 1919, he automatically became the leader of anti Carranza anything, anywhere. Obregonista agents and Magana began their first tentative talks with each other. But though both sides were wary, Magana certainly saw in Obregon a more trustworthy potential ally than practically anywhere else, and also one that was almost sure to be sitting in the presidential palace by the end of the next year. One guy who was about to be taken out of the running for future leader of Mexico was Felipe Ángeles. On November the 15th, 1919, agents of the Federal Army captured Angeles. 
Since leaving Villa back in June, Angel has spent seven months just sort of wandering around northern Mexico with a couple of aides and bodyguards. What he was doing, or why he was doing it, is kind of a mystery. He could have gone back to the United States, maybe returned to politics as a respected exile. There's not really a good explanation for why he didn't. Maybe he was ashamed or embarrassed at his failure. Maybe he was depressed. It's been suggested that he was trying to make a martyr of himself, but wannabe martyrs don't spend seven months camping out and sleeping in caves and dodging enemy patrols. If you want to martyr yourself, you present yourself and dare them to take you alive. Even when Angelus' location was finally betrayed, it was only after a shootout at the cave in Chihuahua where he had been sleeping that he surrendered his gun and agreed to go peacefully. When Carranza found out that Angelus had been captured, he was not exactly happy about it. Carranza wanted Angelus dead. Dead, dead, dead. They were deep personal enemies. But the ambush and murder of Zapata had been surprisingly unpopular out there. And Angelus was famous both at home and abroad, and he was known to be a respected and honorable man, so we can't just kill him. Instead, Carranza ordered the one big show trial of the Mexican Revolution. As you know, show trials in kangaroo courts have a long history in revolutionary and post-revolutionary upheavals. But the Mexican Revolution was pretty free of them. Mexican revolutionaries figured it was just easier to line you up against the wall, shoot you, and then claim you had been trying to escape. But this time there would be a trial. Angeles was brought to Chihuahua City, where he would be court-martialed for insubordination and treason. Which, you know, fair enough. Much to the chagrin of the authorities, though, when Angelus arrived in the city, he was greeted as a popular hero. The people flocked to see him. The ladies of society undertook to make sure that he was comfortable and well-fed. When the trial began, the theater was packed and clearly sympathetic to the defendant. What made this a show trial, though, is that the fix was in from the beginning. The five judges assigned to the court-martial were all vehemently anti-viista, and the verdict was decreed from the beginning. Angelus likely recognized this, and so as his lawyers attempted to mount some legal arguments about the court's standing and the right to appeal, Angelus delivered political speeches. He reiterated that the time had come for peace and reconciliation. He did not denounce Carranza or insist that Mexico fight on. In fact, it was time to lay the guns down. But his biggest applause line came when he said that he believed that Mexico would never be peaceful until it had socialism and social justice— and that the revolution had been started because of unjust abuses by the bosses and the oligarchs and the jefes politicos. The people had been right to rise up against all that. But like I said, this was not a trial. This was a show trial. And after this brief two-day spectacle and some speeches by Angelus, the predetermined verdict was handed down. Death. On November the 26th, 1919, Felipe Angelus was led to the wall. He was lined up against it, and he was executed by a firing squad. 5,000 people attended his funeral procession. Felipe Angelis is mostly a footnote these days. He's overshadowed by larger figures and by the fact that he never really won. He contributed to this because he willingly put himself under Pancho Villa, whose personality is big enough to blot out the sun. But there are other worlds where Felipe Angelis became president of Mexico. Not much would have needed to change to make that happen. And I think he would have been a good president. He was honest. He was well-educated in literature, economics, politics, and science. And as I said when I first introduced him, he did not just read books and papers. He, he wrote them as well. He also cared about the people of Mexico, even if it was in his own kind of condescending patrician way. He cared about them. He wanted to oversee reforms that would make everyone's life a little bit better. He wanted to purge the government of corruption and injustice. He wanted to make Mexico a respected power on the world stage. And if Pancho Villa had listened to him, maybe this series ends with Felipe Angelis being elected president. I mean, who knows? But I can't say this for sure. There is no single turning point in the Mexican Revolution that turns harder than the events of the Ten Tragic Days. What if Francisco Madero had insisted that the loyal and honest and skilled General Angeles be put in charge of his forces in Mexico City instead of bowing to pressure and keeping the treacherous Huerta? <laughs>
Maybe the Mexican Revolution would have been reduced to 18 months of sporadic skirmishing to bring down the Porfiriato and install democracy. Instead, it was 10 years of destructive violence. But none of those turning points ever turned in Onolis' direction, and he was never strong enough to make them turn in his direction. And so, instead of going down in history as one of the greatest leaders in Mexican history, he is a footnote. After dispatching with Anjalis, Carranza turned his attention back to the main problem of Obregón, who was campaigning to cheering crowds across the country. To stand against Obregón, Carranza plucked his ambassador to the United States, a guy named Ignacio Bonillas, to come home and run for president as the quasi-official candidate. And though he was a respectable enough guy, decent diplomat, decent record, Bonillas had no national name recognition and had no party or clique or group of independent supporters. He would be entirely dependent on Carranza's political machine, and that was the whole point. Bonillas would be a puppet to get Carranza around the no re-election rule. Bonillas also happened to be a Sonoran, which Carranza hoped might help split the vote in Obregón's home state. The nomination of Bonillas was the signal to Obregón and his friends that Carranza was really going to contest the election and try to halt Obregón's ascendancy, and they were worried he might not even accept the results if Obregón won. In one of those tragic ironies that we have seen so often in both the history of Rome and revolutions, it was Carranza's attempt to stay in power that led to his downfall. Sensing that Bonillas might not win, and that the Sonorans were sure to organize a resistance if Carranza tried to use force or fraud to install his man in office, Carranza started to make preemptive moves. Exercising dubious executive authority, Carranza replaced generals in Sonora with men who were loyal to him. He reorganized the military zones and transferred more troops into the state, and it was really super obvious that these moves were in preparation for maybe needing to strangle a revolt. Carranza did not understand that these moves were probably going to provoke that very revolt. And they did. There were a flurry of moves in the first week of April 1920. Carranza ordered Obregón to come testify in a trial in Mexico City involving some conspirators who had worked with Felix Diaz, without mentioning that Obregón was not being called as a witness but as a defendant. So Obregón went and faced a judge on April the 6th, where he discovered that they were coming after him on trumped-up charges of conspiring with Felix Diaz. In the meantime, Carranza unilaterally dissolved the power of the Sonoran state government and assumed political and military control of the state, which was, of course, vehemently opposed, and on April the 10th, the entire government of Sonora, from Governor de la Huerta on down, announced that they no longer recognized Carranza's authority. Here, finally, it was 1913 all over again. A state, as a sovereign unit, was now in revolt against an executive that they did not recognize. In Mexico City, Obregón was not happy at all about how this was playing out. He really did want to win at the ballot box, and he was furious that Carranza had forced this crisis and furious that his own supporters in Sonora had embraced such an extreme response so quickly. But what was done was done. Obregón had a quick dinner conference with General Pablo González, who agreed that Carranza had finally gone too far, and the time had come to overthrow him. Correctly believing he was on the verge of being arrested and maybe winding up like Felipe Ángeles, Obregón got help from some railroad workers, and on April the 13th, they snuck him out of the city on a train bound for Iguala, the capital of Guerrero. Over the next few days, Sonora was joined by other Mexican states who denounced Carranza and withdrew their recognition from his government. Sinaloa and Zacatecas joined in solidarity. Then the leaders of the state of Guerrero, where Obregón was right there with them, also signed up. But what were they signing up for? This was all being improvised. And that's when we get the last plan of the Mexican Revolution. We've had a lot of plans in the Mexican Revolution, right? There was Madero's plan of San Luis Potosí, Zapata's plan of Ayala, Carranza's plan of Guadalupe. There were others, but this would be the last. It was dubbed the Plan of Agua Prieta, promulgated on April the 23rd, 1920, from that far northern Sonoran border town. The authors of the plan denounced Carranza, accused him of betraying the Constitution, and declared their intention to remove him from power. The Plan of Agua Prieta, however, did not put Obregón in charge of this movement, Instead, for political reasons, that role went officially to the governor of Sonora, 
Adolfo de la Huerta. De la Huerta was now given military authority and the ability to appoint interim governors to states who signed on to the plan. For Obregón personally, the plan of Agua Prieta was also a declaration that he was abandoning the presidential campaign because Carranza had betrayed the Constitution and he could not, in good conscience, continue. And though he wanted to win at the ballot box, it was the battlefield to which Obregón would have to return. The plan of Agua Prieta was signed by 107 senior military officers, and it created a new liberal constitutionalist army. Pablo González signaled his support while holding personal authority over 22,000 troops in the vicinity of the federal district. The bulk of the political and military leadership of Mexico was lining up against Carranza. In Morelos, the Carranza-appointed governor called for an assembly of municipal leaders, and they were supposed to vote a show of support for Carranza, but instead they voted to back Obregón and the plan of Agua Prieta. Magaña and the Zapatistas were overjoyed by this shockingly widespread and immediate rejection of President Carranza. It only confirmed that he had done the right thing by working to align the Zapatistas with Obregón. So up in the hills, the Zapatista rebels applauded this vote by the official state authorities, the very state authorities they had just been fighting. Suddenly, they were on the same side. On May the 2nd, Obregón departed Aguala, headed north towards Mexico City. And to get there, he had to pass through Morelos, where he was met by a mixed group of civilian officials and Zapatista chiefs, including De La O, though Magaña himself was elsewhere. This group then moved as one towards the capital, with Obregón being escorted by De La O's little Zapatista guerrilla army, which is a crazy turn of events, the implacable rebel now providing the personal bodyguard for the future president of Mexico. Recognizing that he could not hold Mexico City, Carranza decided to reestablish himself at Veracruz, which had served so successfully as his base of operations in 1914 and 1915. He still had a core of supporters with him, and they spent the first week of May 1920 loading up every rail car they could find with every valuable thing they could find, from food to gold to bullets and ammunition. When it was all lined up, this convoy stretched out over eight miles. On May the 7th, the convoy departed the capital, but the trains never made it to Veracruz. Under sustained guerrilla attacks the whole way, the train eventually had to stop when the lines were cut in the state of Puebla. Facing certain capture, Carranza and a small group of aides took off on horseback into the mountains heading north, probably with half a notion to make it to his old home state of Coahuila, where he might muster some last well of support. But he never made it there either. And while Carranza took off for the hills, Obregón and his entourage entered Mexico City on May the 9th, and if there was one thing Obregón knew how to do, it was enter Mexico City as a conquering hero. Carranza managed to stay on the run for the next two weeks. Eventually, he was contacted by General Rodolfo Herrero, a regional federal army commander who offered Carranza refuge in a small town. Accommodations were a mere rough hut, but at least they'd be safe. Carranza accepted this offer, but he was not safe at all. Herrero had already gone over to Obregón and now took it upon himself to solve the great problem of what to do about Carranza. In the small hours of the morning of May the 21st, 1920, still night really, a group of gunmen surrounded the hut where Carranza slept, and they opened fire. Then they burst in and they fired some more. When the smoke cleared, Venustiano Carranza, first chief of the Constitutionalist Revolution and then president of Mexico, lay dead on the floor. What can you say about Carranza? His career is inexplicable. In times of rebellion and revolution, it is to charismatic leaders that people turn, because you have to forge new centers of authority and power where none have existed before. Practically everybody we've talked about so far on the podcast, from Cromwell to Bolivar to Toussaint Louverture to now Villa and Zapata, had some kind of charismatic spark. But so far as I can tell, there's really nobody who walked away from a personal meeting with Carranza without thinking, God, what a cold, dead fish of a man. He had anti-charisma. And yet from 1913 to 1920, Carranza held together a revolutionary coalition that eventually put him into power, almost through sheer perseverance of determined, unstoppable ego. Carranza had pushed through it all. At some point, everyone had tried to get rid of him. 
Obregón, the Americans, Villa, Angeles, there was a good two years where the starting point of any peaceful reconciliation in Mexico was an agreement that Carranza had to go. But he had built up just enough of a machine, secured just enough loyalty, though mostly through mercenary politicking, that he stayed and he stayed. The crazy old wizard-looking dude from Coahuila had gotten what he wanted. He had been elected president of Mexico. But in the end, nobody actually wanted him to be president of Mexico. No one actually liked him. And when he died, no one really mourned his death. Mostly, they were just happy he was finally gone. With the death of Carranza, the authors of the plan of Agua Prieta found themselves in a much easier position. The national mood, military and civilian alike, was with them. The National Congress formally appointed Adolfo de la Huerta provisional president to oversee new elections, which would be scheduled for September. De la Huerta would not himself be a candidate. He was just there to hold the line until Obregón could be elected and sworn in. De la Huerta's brief term as provisional president was mostly about doing whatever it took to bring peace and stability after the latest round of armed rebellion to have a sort of grand reset and refound a new post-revolutionary Mexico. So, for example, De La Huerta's emissaries went out and tracked down Felix Diaz, who was still out in the vicinity of Veracruz, and arranged safe passage for him out of the country in exchange for quitting the field. And this was a pretty okay deal for Diaz. Fighting against the unpopular Carranza, there was hope he might one day win. Fighting the popular Obregón, who the whole nation had just rallied to? Not so much. So Diaz took the deal and he left for exile. He would remain in exile until he was finally allowed back into the country in 1937, and he would die in Veracruz in 1945. De La Huerta was also able to effect the end of the Zapatista Rebellion. In an abrupt change of fortunes for the Zapatistas, Magana's support for Obregón had paid off, and in a deal to bring peace finally to the tiny, troubled state of Morelos, Various Zapatista chiefs were given commands in police or militia forces, while the soldiers were formally incorporated into the Federal Army as the Division of the South. Magana and De La O were both made divisional generals. After ten years out in the cold, the Zapatistas would finally be working in concert with and under the auspices of a national government who was making more or less sincere promises. Now, Obregón was no radical land reformer, but he wanted peace, and the people of Morelos rejoiced that they now had the opportunity to do what they had always wanted to do, which was just peacefully tend to their villages and families. In late June 1920, one of the greatest obstacles to peace for all those same long ten years came calling. Pancho Villa sent a message to De La Huerta. He said, I'd like to negotiate a peaceful retirement for myself and my men. Villa had waited long enough, the despised Carranza was now in the ground. It was time to lay down his arms and retire. Villa was lucky that it was De La Huerta in the president's chair at that moment because De La Huerta was one of the few Sonoran leaders Villa had not clashed with directly and who bore him no personal grudge. But it would still be a difficult negotiation because Obregón had a deeply personal grudge against Villa. He believed Villa needed to be shot or imprisoned or exiled, certainly not allowed to retire in peace. But De La Huerta exercised some independence, with the suspicion being that he had his own future career to think about, and he wanted the prestige of being the one to tame Pancho Villa, and possibly to be the one who could call on Villa down the road. So what De La Huerta offered was that Villa could have an hacienda for himself and for his remaining men to settle on. Villa requested maybe a command in the local rurales to assist, as he said, in the curbing of banditry in the region, De La Huerta refused to allow Villa to hold any kind of military command, but after a few weeks of back and forth, they finally came to an acceptable agreement. Villa would get a large and secluded hacienda in northern Durango. Ultimately, 800 of Villa's men would be granted a year's salary and given land to settle on near Villa. Villa himself would be granted a large pension and allowed to keep 50 armed men as a bodyguard, and that bodyguard would be paid for by the government. Obregón was furious when he heard these terms, and when a formal written agreement was drawn up at the end of July, he refused to sign it. But the other leaders of the Agua Prieta coalition, eh, this was a price they could pay. If it would get Villa to retire and make no more trouble, I mean, let's do it. And Villa seemed sincere. Carranza was dead, 
what would he even be fighting for if he kept fighting? The brief De La Huerta administration thus succeeded in corralling and pacifying the most violently rebellious parts of Mexico and get them to accept the legitimacy of the coming post-revolutionary regime. De La Huerta and his administration did not enjoy the same recognition from the United States, then in the throes of their own presidential election, and seriously ticked off there was yet another rebellion-slash-armed coup, and that a democratically elected president of Mexico had once again been assassinated. So the United States refused to recognize De La Huerta's legitimacy. Though it was indicated through channels that the United States might overcome their democratic scruples if, say, De La Huerta annulled the offending Article 27 of the Constitution that so threatened American business interests in Mexico, De La Huerta refused. So Mexico braced again for an invasion, but that invasion did not come. And a nationwide democratic election was about to give Obregón an unignorable mandate. On September the 5th, 1920, Mexico once again went back to the polls for the democratic coronation of Alvaro Obregón. He secured 1.1 million votes. His next closest rival secured all of 47,000. President-elect Obregón then wrote a note to Pancho Villa, saying that his administration would honor its side of the bargain if Villa honored his side. It was time to end the Mexican Revolution, to end the cycles of violence and revenge, to bury all hatchets, to now rebuild and reform Mexico. The revolution had made both of them, but it was time to leave that in the past and, like Mexico, become something new. On December the 1st, 1920, Alvaro Obregón was sworn in as president of Mexico, and that is where we will arbitrarily mark the end of the Mexican Revolution. It had begun almost exactly 10 years earlier with the publication of Francisco Madero's plan of San Luis Potosí. The elevation of Obregón begins a new era. It marks the end of the revolution and the beginning of the so-called Sonoran dynasty, which would control national politics for the next 14 years. And that is why this is such a convenient place to mark the end of the revolution proper. Obregón and the Sonorans would pick through the rubble and stabilize Mexico using a mix of pragmatism, improvisation, and not a small amount of corrupt hypocrisy, which is what we will be talking about next week in our final, final episode. What had the Mexican Revolution meant? What would it mean in the future? What does it still mean today? Today.